Good evening to you all. I'm Philip Kuhnhardt. I'm the founder of and director of NYU's Center for the Study of Transformative Lives, which is dedicated to bringing the study and teaching of lives more fully into the life of the university. Welcome to what my colleague David Levering Lewis has called one of our transformative evenings. <laughs> You're in for something. <laughs> and what a diverse and interesting group you all are here tonight. I'm so thrilled to be able to bring to you this evening's speaker, Roxana Robinson, and her subject, the life of Georgia O'Keeffe, an artist who for many of us has held a mysterious and powerful draw over many decades. When I was in college in the 1970s, Georgia O'Keeffe was still alive in New Mexico and an important icon to my generation and to our, our era's feminism. I took a trip to the Southwest in 1973 and traveled to Santa Fe and out to Taos. I never made it to Ghost Ranch, though we talked about going there. But I stayed in a small adobe house in which D.H. Lawrence had once lived. And I sat by the fireplace that he used to sit by and tell stories. He, of course, was part of Georgia O'Keeffe's world there and exemplified for me at the time the great vitality of living. I could see why O'Keeffe liked him and his wife, Frida. I was staying then with a close friend by Hooper, who later married the director of Naropa Institute in Colorado. And we hiked one day to some springs in the hills above Taos to luxuriate in the hot pools and the warm waterfalls. And I remember looking out and feeling that great sky above us that O'Keefe loved so much. I was hoping that my father's longtime colleague and friend, John Lowengard, would be here tonight, a good friend of Roxana and Tony's. He paid visits to the aging O'Keefe and photographed her for Life magazine and later did a book where he juxtaposed his photographs and some of her paintings. It's a quite of a wonderful tribute. She was a free spirit, completely herself a breaker of barriers, a model for both men and women in the 1960s and 70s who cared about the land, about Native American culture and art, about women's independence, and about artistic freedom. And no one has understood her better as a writer than Roxana Robinson. Roxana is a friend of mine from Maine, where her husband Tony and I serve on the board of a marvelous tiny college called College of the Atlantic on Mount Desert Island. We were having dinner together last fall at Sam Hamill's house. And I'm so pleased that Sam is here tonight as well. And I was telling Roxanne about my center at NYU when suddenly with sparkling eyes, she offered to speak here. <laughs> Roxana Robinson has been called one of our finest writers. She's been compared to Edith Wharton and to Henry James. She has the profound ability to enter into the lives of others and to imagine them so fully she can evoke them into life. Many of us were mesmerized by the riveting portrait in her novel Cost of a young man in the grips of an addiction to heroin and its deadly effect on his whole family. Roxana has compared her art to that of a tuning fork, listening so carefully and empathically to her subjects that she comes to vibrate in tune with them and can allow their truths to come through her and her pen with minimal interference. It is a method I greatly admire and which worked to perfection in her treatment of Georgia O'Keeffe. In her talk and in conversation to follow, 
Roxana will explore Georgia O'Keeffe's inner journey, her personal transformations as an artist and as a human being, subjects that resonate deeply with this center and its mission. After the talk, I've been asked to announce that there will be a book signing and reception for, uh, and give you a chance to speak with Roxana more uh, in a different kind of a way. And I hope you'll all stay. And so with that, it's with great pleasure that I introduce to you our spring speaker, Roxana Robinson. Thank you. Thank you for that um, very eloquent introduction. And of course, it's a great pleasure for me to be here and to talk about someone I admire so much and someone whose life I entered into so deeply at one time. I got to the top alone in the moonlight, just as day was beginning to come. It was great, the wind and the stars and the clouds below, and all the time, I was terribly afraid of snakes. Georgia wrote this about a camping trip she took in 1916, and in a way, this quote exemplifies her approach to life and to her art. Like a hero, she's always ready to embark upon the great adventure, but like a human, she's aware of the risks. Being courageous means doing something that frightens you and conquering your fear. Georgia Tato O'Keefe was born in Sun Prairie, Wisconsin in 1887, and her family's story is in some ways an archetypal American story. Both her grandparents came to the Midwest. Her father's father, Pierce O'Keefe, came in an ox cart in, 18, in the 1840s. He broke the soil, the sod, and he tilled the soil, and he tamed the land, and so did her mother's father, who was an exiled Hungarian count. So they are the story of America. They came from other countries, they um, established themselves, they claimed the land, and they made it their own. One of the things that farming teaches you is a kind of exigence, and so in Georgia's family, she was the second child. She was the um, second of seven children and the oldest of five daughters. And her family was um, a warm and supportive family, but the land itself is very demanding. So there was a kind of um, unyieldingness about her life and her family. So what it taught her, apart from a love of the land and a love of the life that her parents had, was um, an absolute conviction about the way you should be in the world. Self-reliance, a commitment to the task, and courage. So those were things that O'Keefe was taught by her culture, by the landscape, and by her family. The family was successful. Her father had ended up with over 600 acres. They were distinguished in the community. They cared about education. All their children went to boarding school and were meant to go on to college. But what happened was tuberculosis moved through their family and, and it took the lives of all the males in her father's family. So around 1900, the family moved. They left the Midwest, they sold the farm, and they were fairly affluent at that point, sold the farm and moved to Williamsburg, Virginia, where they thought it would be warm and comfortable and the climate would be more forgiving. The climate was more forgiving, but fortune was not on their side in the South. They moved to Williamsburg and Georgia went to school at Chatham Hall, which was a local boarding school for women. Um, she had a wonderful art teacher who supported her and a wonderful principal who supported her work. She didn't really care about any of the other subjects and was such a bad speller that she nearly didn't graduate, but the other subjects supported her and she, she did graduate. Um, she went then to, um, to from, uh, from 1904 to about 1918, she moved around constantly. So I will 
I will be telling you she now she this year she's here next year she's there because of studying because of work because of illness and because of her family so she moves around in 1906 she went to Chicago to study at the Art Institute of Chicago she lived with an aunt it was the first time she lived in a big city um, she hated it she hated the grim industrial northern city of Chicago but she loved the the art school there Chicago in at the turn of the last century was um, an important cultural center in the Midwest but it was very remote from the rest of the world and it was not a hotbed of artistic ideas I'm sorry to report that but it's true um, so the way they taught was by a very old-fashioned and traditional method and Georgia was asked to draw geometrical objects and to draw from the plaster casts of the of classical sculpture and for composition they copied the old masters so it was a completely imitative uh, kind of course. It was very good. It taught her great mechanical and fundamental um, information about painting, but there was no, no chance for the creative side. So she went there for two years um, and got typhoid fever and returned to um, Virginia. She didn't go back after the typhoid. Instead, she went in 1907 to New York, and this was um, this was a big deal. She didn't live with a f with her family anymore. She was 20 years old, and she was in the center of the art world in America. She studied at the Art Students League with William Merritt Chase. So that was just landing in clover. It was it was wonderful. He was a great star in the art world. He was a star at the Art Students League. And he had been to Europe and studied at, at the School of Munich, which was very fashionable in his generation. And it involved um, somber underpainting and what was called a bravura brushstroke, which you would recognize if you saw his paintings. And the Impressionists use it, used it too. It's this slashing, visible, brushy stroke, very different from the old masters whose brushstrokes are invisible. So with the old masters, you're meant to think that you're in the place with them. But the Impressionists and the Munich School allowed the artist to be present. Here's his brushstroke. You can see it's a painting, not um, a, third, a fourth wall. So um, uh, uh, William Merritt Chase was sort of the star of the Art Students League. He embodied the new art coming in from Europe. It was relatively new. It was the Impressionists. Um, and he asked his students for decisiveness, speed. They had to paint a painting every every week, and they painted over the old canvases. So they just went on and on and on. They had to make decisions. They had to do the work, and they liked that. He was very demanding, but very supportive, vital. He wanted velocity. He wanted light and vitality, high-toned colors. So there was a lot of energy involved in his work and his, um, his classes. Um, so there O'Keefe is, she's, she does very well, she excels in his class, she's very popular, and she's suddenly in the middle of this bohemian world of artists in New York City. She goes to masked balls, she goes to student parties, and she's having a lot of fun. She's, everyone loves her. So then she realizes that she's going to start to make choices. She reads a self-help book, which has been lost to history, but it, she reads a book, and then she starts deciding that this is going to define her future. She buys a notebook, and, on, and she opens it, and on at the right side of the page, she writes no at the top of it, and on the left hand, she writes yes. And she said, from then on, whenever I had a decision to make, on the left hand, on the right hand side, I would write the reasons why I should not do it, and on the left hand side, I'd write why I should do it. And she said, and that made me see clearly what it was I really wanted to do. And from then on, I did the things I really wanted to do. And I didn't do the other things. And she said that she's 20. She said, that's when I stopped dancing. She said, I loved to dance, but if I danced all night, I couldn't paint for three days. So that's a big kind of decision for a 20-year-old on her own in New York City to make. But that was the way she saw her life. So she studied with William Merritt Chase, and that winter, 1908, she, in February, she meets Alfred Stieglitz for the first time. 
Alfred Stieglitz was um, 23 years older than she was, born the same, he was the same age as her mother. He was married. He was uh, the educated son of educated, affluent German um, Jewish immigrants. He grew up in Hoboken, which is a very distinguished suburb. He studied in Berlin, studied photography, came back to this country and was a zealot and a proselytizer. And he was determined to make photography into a valid art form, which it wasn't considered at that time. His own work and his own efforts just galvanized the world of photography. And by 1908, he had gone into a kind of aesthetic partnership with Edward Steichen, also a photographer and a painter as well. Now, Steichen's background was French. So although uh, Stieglitz would have turned to Berlin and to Germany for art artistic references, Steichen would go to Paris, and he went there periodically. So Steichen was the was the channel for the, the new ideas that came from France. So it was Steichen who introduced to Stieglitz the new French painters. So Rodin and Picasso and Cezanne and those people that Stieglitz would never have known about it if it had not been from his, for his French partner. So he was famous in the art world and certainly famous at the Art Students League. And the students said to Georgia, let's go over to 291, his gallery, um, and get Stieglitz talking. He was like a vaudeville show. You'd go in and you'd ask him a question and he'd start to rant. He was confrontational, he was dramatic, he loved arguing, he was very handsome, he was charismatic, and this is the way he used his energy. And he was really fun. Um, however, Georgia didn't like any part of it. She went to the gallery, she thought on the wall they were just scribbles, and she, they got Stieglitz talking, she said he was too loud, he was too bossy, and she went and stood in the corner of the room until they were ready to leave. So that was her first encounter with Stieglitz. Didn't like the work, didn't like the person, and he didn't remember her. So it was a, a kind of an awkward start off, but that was not the end of their relationship. You'll be surprised to hear. Um, at the end of that year, O'Keefe went back to Williamsburg, and the family was running out of money. Um, he, her father hadn't been able to farm. It was different in Virginia. He'd gone into different enterprises. They weren't working out. And um, the family had, had, the mother had moved the family to Charlottesville, where she was taking in boarders. Um, so in the fall, there, there was no money for her to go back and study in New York. So in the fall, she went back to Chicago to live with her aunt, and she became a commercial artist. She was there for two years, and again, she hated Chicago. She hated the cold, she hated the industrial city, and she really hated the work. And what she was doing was drawing pictures of lace for the Sunday supplements. And it was deadening. And she couldn't see how this was going to get better. She wasn't finding any other work. Drawing lace for the newspapers was, seemed like the end of her life. And then she got the measles, another illness. And it affected her eyesight, and she went back to Virginia. And this was 1910. And at this point, she experienced a real crisis as a person as an, and as an artist. And she quit art. She said, this was my life, it's no longer my life. I can't see any way to go on with it. I can't study, there's no more money for me to study. I can't go on working like that. Um, and there's no way for me to continue it at home. There was another factor that I think was involved in this, and that had to do with gender, um, as everything does. So at the Art Students League, William Merritt Chase, as I say, was a tremendously larger-than-life character. And his physical presence was also part of his body of work. So he would come into class wearing a high silk top hat, a fur-lined cloak, a neat brown suit with a, uh, with a flower in his buttonhole, pale, pale gloves, a walking stick, and spats. So you couldn't not see him as this sort of impresario of the art world. He was a dandy, he was the opposite of the bohemian artist. That had not happened yet. 
So in some ways, his corporeal presence was something that was stopping O'Keefe from being an artist. If he was an artist, if this was an artist, if this was the king artist of New York, then where was the room for her? So that was a part of her feeling, although I don't think she expressed that. Another element was the fact that she had, she had excelled as a student under Chase, and in fact she had won the William Merritt Chase Award for a still life that she did. It's still at the Art Student League. You can go and ask the, to see it. Um, which has internalized his, his teachings to such an extent that it looks simply like a William Merritt Chase still life. It's a dead rabbit with some brass pots. And there is no trace in it that I can see of Georgia O'Keeffe. But it's a perfect example of the painting style that he was using himself and that he was teaching. So she really felt trapped. There was a dead end. She just couldn't see any way for herself to continue. She couldn't work. She, she wasn't going to go on drawing lace. She wasn't going to live in the city if that's where you had to be. She couldn't see any way for herself to paint. And also, artists were men. When she was at the Art Students League, there was another student there named Eugene Spiker. And he asked O'Keefe if she would pose for him. She did pose for one, one portrait, which is still extant. And then she, he wanted to do her again. And she said, you know, I, I can't. It's too time consuming. I have my own work to do. And he said, it doesn't matter what you do. You will be a school teacher, but I will be a famous artist. Just for a, side, a moment aside, how many people in this room have heard of the famous artist of Eugene Spiker? Um, so, but anyway, that was very much an undercurrent in the art world. O'Keefe was aware that, that um, men felt this way. That women were allowed to be students, there were a lot of them, but the famous artists were men. So she felt that she had reached a dead end at this moment in, in 1910. She was living with her family. And she stopped painting and said, I will never paint again. She wouldn't even go into a room that had paint and turpentine in it because the smell was so upsetting to her. So that lasted for about 10 months, and in the spring of 1911, her old teacher from Chatham Hall asked her if she would substitute teach for six weeks. And O'Keefe agreed to do that. She liked the woman, and she, so she did that. And all of a sudden, a little tiny window was open to her. She realized that she could do something that she loved. She found she liked teaching. She could live in the countryside. It was very beautiful there. And she would get paid for it. And she said later that after that, she really knew she was never ever worried about selling her paintings after that. She knew, she said, if I couldn't sell my paintings, I could teach. So I was always comfortable with being an artist. It was never a risk for me. So she taught, and then that summer, so that, uh, that slid her tinily into the art world again. And then that summer, two of her sisters were taking a summer class at the University of Virginia with a teacher from Columbia here in New York um, who was teaching from here from there from the Columbia Teachers College. Now he was teaching, and they said, her sister said, come with us to the art class. And O'Keefe said, you know, honestly, I have done art classes. I don't need to come to your summer class. And they said, no, 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 he's really interesting. So she came to one class, and it changed her life. He was teaching precepts that were drawn on Japanese, the Japanese aesthetic. It was a totally different way of approaching art, and the Japanese um, aesthetic was totally different from the Western European aesthetic. And it just opened for O'Keefe, a whole new way of looking at art, teaching it, and thinking about it. And one of the first, um, this was a man called Arthur Wesley Dow, whose, whose ideas they were, and he was the head of the art department at Columbia Teachers College. And what he would do is start off, so remember what she was doing in Chicago. She was drawing from casts of Roman statues or drawing pictures of cubes. What these study exercises did, I would give you a piece of blank paper and a pen and ask you to draw a line separating the space into two parts. And you decide where the line goes, what shape it is, and what those sh two sh parts of the page will be.
So immediately, the responsibility for the aesthetics is put in the hands of the student. The student is immediately an artist. And this was so radical. He was challenging the entire history of the teaching of art in this country. And it was also revolutionary for O'Keeffe. Suddenly she felt as though she were being asked to do her own work instead of copy somebody else. So this changed her attitude towards everything. She did brilliantly at this, um, in these classes, she signed up for classes herself, did brilliantly, and was asked to come back and teach, uh, be an assistant teacher the next year, which meant that she had to get some experience So in teaching high school. So instead of finding if there was a, a high school um, position in Williamsburg, Virginia, she wrote to a friend from Chatham Hall who lived in Amarillo, Texas, and got herself a job teaching at a high school in Amarillo, Texas, a place she had never been. She had never taught a whole year at a high school. She didn't know how to do it. It's like walking up that mountain in the dark. She went out to Amarillo and fell in love with Texas. She just loved the landscape, loved the openness, loved the wind, loved the sense of space, um, and... Um, made her way through that year teaching the high school students, and she loved them, and she loved teaching. And I read interviews with them. They loved her. She was a great teacher. And she said, one of the things she said that she did there, she was teaching these Japanese precepts, and she said, filling a space in a beautiful way, that's what art means to me. I, l I, I tried to convey to them the idea that art is important in everyday life. I wanted them to learn the principle that when you buy a pair of shoes or place a window in the front of your house or address a letter or comb your hair, consider it carefully so that it looks well. So that became her way of approaching life. And it, it was so satisfying to her to realize that aesthetics should be a part of every choice, every decision that you make. Um, in 19... 14, she went back to um, New York and she started studying, taking classes at Columbia Teachers College. Um, so she could study with Arthur Wesley Dow, who had created these, I, these um, exercises. And now, seven years later, after she'd been there before, the art world was really exploding. There were all kinds of radical things going on there. Um, and Stieglitz had been showing Matisse, Picasso, Rousseau. He was the first to show Rodin, Cezanne, Toulouse-Lautrec, and Brock. So he was, he was showing paintings that no one has ever, had ever heard of before, and the, the art world was just on fire. She became, O'Keeffe became friends with a woman called Anita Pollitzer, who was a lively, pretty young woman from um, South Carolina. And Anita became friends with Stieglitz, but O'Keeffe still found him too noisy and too bombastic and too melodramatic, so she stayed away from him. But she admired the work he was doing, and this was the first time that she saw the abstract American art, uh, work by John Marin, Arthur Dove, and Marston Hartley. And she admired the fact that he was supporting Americans as well as showing Europeans. Um, that summer, in 1915, she was back in Virginia, and this time she was teaching at UVA, and she meets a man called Arthur McMahon. He is tall, handsome, he's a student, he's a graduate student in, polit in political science at Columbia University, and he's teaching there too. He's full of ideas, his mother's a feminist, he has all kinds of new thoughts for Georgia. She reads books that he brings her. They go hiking together. She would be quick to say there was nothing more than friendship between them. However, there was, actually. And after he left and went back to um, to New York, again, there was no money for for Georgia's tuition, and this year she spends in Columbia, South Carolina, teaching at a small Methodist women's college. So she's isolated out in the countryside, and all her friends are back in New York, Arthur McMahon among them. She starts, the two of them start writing that fall, and their writing, their connection becomes more and more intense. And she writes to Anita and says, it's so crazy. I 
would like to warn you, never fall in love. It's just will eat your life up. I, I, I'm not doing it, but I'm. Th it wouldn't happen to me, but if it did happen, it would be just a nightmare. So don't ever let it happen to you. So um, at that fall, Arthur McMahon comes down for Thanksgiving to Columbia, South Carolina, where Georgia O'Keeffe is. They have four rapturous days together over Thanksgiving, and then he goes back to New York. I'm telling you all this because the timing is very important. He goes back at, on, say, December 1st, and O'Keefe has the rest of December at the school. At the school closes for Christmas. She stays there to save money. So she's there alone over Christmas. She is in the countryside. She is out in the boondocks. She is gripped by a passionate emotional storm, and she's alone. And it's during that, that time that she does the first great charcoal drawings that reveal Georgia O'Keeffe, the artist who she became. They're beautifully controlled. They're masterful pieces of technique. They're abstractions. They are so powerful emotionally that th she declares herself in these works. And when she's finished doing them, say December 28th, she rounds, ro rolls them into a mailing tube and sends them to uh, Anita Pollitzer in New York and says, what do you think of these? Anita Pollitzer doesn't answer, but takes them over by hand to Alfred Stieglitz's gallery. January 1st, 1916, she walks into his gallery and says, I have something you'd like to see. He says, come into the back room. The gallery is silent. It's, January, it's New Year's Day. There's no one else there. He opens the papers, spreads them out on the table, looks at each one and says, at last, a woman on paper. And that's the true meeting between Stieglitz and O'Keefe. That's where they first meet through his eye and her art. So that be begins their long relationship, which of course you know is coming. They start, they write to each other that the rest of that year. Then O'Keefe moves again. She leaves the uh, college in South Carolina. She's offered a job teaching in Canyon, Texas th the next fall. She has to come back to New York and get a te take another teaching class um, at, the, at Columbia Teachers College. So she comes up to New York in the spring. She's been writing to Stieglitz, and he describes what happens at the end of the semester. He, um, he hangs her paintings at the end of the season after everybody, the critics have gone, so he doesn't think anyone's going to see it. And he doesn't advertise it. He just hangs them. Someone hears about it, and she goes down to see them. And he describes the scene. He says, a young woman with a Madonna-like face, a black dress, and a white collar comes into the gallery, and she says, who gave you permission to hang these pictures? And he says, no one. And she says, well, you will have to take them down. And he says, I don't think so. And she says, you will. I am Georgia O'Keeffe, and I painted them. I drew them. And he says, you have no more right. Remember, Stieglitz tells this story, so he comes out best. <laughs> Stieglitz says, you have no more right to withdraw these paintings from the world than you would to withdraw a child you had born. So that's the end of the conversation, according to Stieglitz. The pictures stay up, and um, O'Keefe is on one level thrilled, of course, to have a, an exhibition at Stieglitz's gallery. Then she goes back um, that fall. She goes out to Canyon, Texas, and this is again. She is um, she's still um, writing to Arthur McMahon. She's still in love with him. And she goes back, and this is where she really encounters Texas, the Texas that we know from her work. Once again, she is sequestered. She's away from any kind of sophisticated cultural world. She's way out nowhere in Canyon, Texas. It's beautiful there. She's transported by the beauty of the landscape, the weather, the pyrotechnics of the sky. And she paints some of her best paintings that she ever does that, that year. She, this is a letter that she writes to Anita. Tonight, I walked out into the sunset. The whole sky, and there is so much of it out here, was blazing. I walked out past the last house and sat on the fence for a long time, just looking at the lightning. You see, there was nothing but sky and flat prairie land, just the wind 
It is absurd the way I love this country. And it's there and during this time that she does those beautiful, light-filled, abstract pictures of the sunset, the evening sky, um, the train coming across the prairie. So she has entered into a phase of incredible productivity and she's really found her own way of reacting to the world. And these paintings she does are semi-abstract, filled with color and light, and she is clearly becoming the art, she's, she has become the artist that she, that she is. Um, then another crisis occurs. Um, that winter she goes to, to, um, to New York and because she's, she is corresponding now with Stieglitz. Um, so she's now in the, in the sort of the, the swim of the New York art world. So she goes to New York periodically. She meets Paul Strand, a very handsome photographer, a little bit younger than she is. And she is smitten by both him and his work. And his work does something that was really radical in the world of photography. He was one of the first artists ever to do abstract compositions. And what he did, if you can Im imagine his pictures was to take common objects, magnify them, and crop them so that they were un unidentifiable and they became very beautiful abstract compositions. One of the famous ones is white bowls that, that he takes a photograph of so that you don't, you don't know what it is, but it's very beautiful. Um, O'Keeffe was struck by him and by his work, and we'll talk later about how she used some of his techniques and his approaches. But um, she was smitten by him, so she was now smitten by Stieglitz, who was very handsome and pursuing her like mad, although he was married. Strand, who was writing to her, they were writing wonderful, evocative letters. She was still writing to Arthur McMahon. And she actually had a boyfriend in Canyon, too, a really nice young man called Ted Reed, who was a student of hers, um, also a bit younger. Um, and the college didn't like the fact that she and Ted Reed would go out walking into the sunset. That was not what young uh, single teachers were supposed to do. And then what happened in the fall of 1917, this is the crisis approaching, World War I was declared, and Canyon, Texas was a very chauvinistic, patriotic, sort of jingoistic place. And O'Keefe got into a fracas with a, school t with a shopkeeper. She felt very ambivalent about the war. She supported pacif um, pacifism and conscientious objectors, and that was not the way Canyon, Texas felt at all. So suddenly, from being a beloved teacher who felt very much a part of the community and felt supported by them, she felt like an outsider. She became a pariah. She also went into a, a slough of depression. She stopped painting, um, which may have been a sort of a care, oh, sorry the year before her mother had died from tuberculosis. So the spring, the summer of 1916 was a devastating one for O'Keefe. And I think this caught up with her the following year. So 1917, she had another crisis, stopped painting, um, finally kept on teaching in Canyon. In January of 1918, she got influenza, which was the epidemic that was sweeping the country and killing thousands of people. And she left, quit her job, left Canyon, and moved to the south of Texas to stay with a friend who would help her convalesce. So at this point, Stieglitz and Strand are in New York. They're both in love with her. They're both desperate about her. They're writing to her, and they decide that somebody should go and rescue her. So Paul Strand takes the train down to Waring, Texas, and makes his plea. So at this moment, O'Keefe is asked to choose once again between two kinds of lives. Texas has given her a new lease of, of, on her art. She's done work in Texas unlike anything she's done anywhere else. She loves the landscape. She loves certain of the people. She knows she can teach there, and it's a kind of life that she loves. On the other hand, New York is the center of the art world, and she knows if she goes back to New York, she will find a kind of intellectual support and aesthetic support that she wouldn't find in Texas. She chooses New York. So she goes back on the train with Paul Strand, and there's a slight negotiation between Strand and Stieglitz, but it really was never an issue. Stieglitz takes O'Keefe under his aegis, moves her into his niece's 
uh, studio apartment and leaves his wife. And that was that. So um, that was the second time she had to make a large choice like that. That's 1918, and from then on, really, her life and Stieglitz's um, don't diverge. They, they are together. He was obviously a very important dealer, and his professional support was supremely important to her. And there are certainly critics who still don't like O'Keefe and who would say she would never have been famous without Stieglitz. He's the person who made her. She's not really a great artist. It's probably true she would never have been as famous as she is without Stieglitz. She would still have been one of our greatest artists. But um, the, the undercurrents in the art world, as, as in all parts of our world, are weighted against women, and she had in Stieglitz the champion that every woman artist and writer needs, is a dealer who is her husband. Um, <laughs> so Stieglitz was an absolute champion, and this was where his energy and his melodrama and his confrontational side worked to her advantage. He was wonderful. He never, never, ever stepped back. And at one point, a critic came into one of her shows and looked at the work and said, "What do you? Why, why are you? Why do you think this is great? This is just. These are just pictures by a woman who wants to have a baby." And Stieglitz said, instead of saying, "No, no, see them in a different context," he said, "What's wrong with that?" <laughs> yes, own it. So um, he was great. He just he never backed down. He supported her. He thought she was a genius, and he never let anyone. Um, threaten him into, into uh, taking a step backwards. At one point, the Pennsylvania Academy of Art asked him to curate an exhibition of American modernists with his stable of artists. And they said, but we don't want any damn women in the show. And he said, well, then you're not having me or any of my artists. So he just was relentless and refused to let anyone ever say that O'Keefe was a second rank or that she was the woman artist uh, as opposed to his artists. Um, so in that sense, he was certainly important in terms of raising her to the level of fame that she has. On the other hand, she was incredibly popular. Half the critics loved her, some of them hated her, but a lot of the critics loved her, and the world loved her. People came in and recognized in that, those paintings things they'd never seen in any other paintings. So she was incredibly popular, and what she did when she was, during this period of 1918 to 1928, particularly in the beginning, when she was rapturously in love with Stieglitz, who was a charming, charismatic, very warm and exuberant man, um, she started using those Paul Strand techniques of cropping and magnification. So what he did was to create these very austere, abstract images. What she did, remember her those images of the, of the flowers, tiny images cropped and magnified. And what she did, what he did was to drain the pictures of emotion or any kind of psychological impact. And what she did was infuse them with emotion, but by using those two compositional techniques that he had that he had revealed to her. So she did this work that was that was astonishing, and the the the, the world loved it. And for ten years, they they worked very happily together. In 1928, trouble appears on the horizon in the form of a woman called Dorothy Norman. Dorothy Norman was beautiful. She was younger than O'Keefe. She was dark hair, dark eyed, loved art, was rich, was unhappily married, had nothing to do, and guess what? She came into the gallery, started talking to Stieglitz, offered to volunteer, and pretty soon she was there all the time. She was at the gallery every day. They were really having a very public affair. He took photographs of her that were nude or semi-nude that he exhibited in his next um, shows. O'Keefe was a a alone in her studio, and the two of them were at the gallery day after day after day. Um, it was taxing. It was it was humiliating. It was shaming. It was it was painful. Um, but O'Keefe, remember, was brought up to believe in self-reliance, and the main thing that drove her was the idea that you take responsibility for your own happiness. You don't blame other people. I honestly believe she never 
discussed Dorothy Norman with her husband. I don't think that conversation ever happened. I believe she was very, very unhappy at what was happening, but she never raised it. What she did instead in 1929 was take her first trip to Santa Fe, a place that completely revivified her. She found new images, new, new pictures to paint. She came back suntanned, um, vigorous, energetic. She'd been riding through the mountains with a Navajo, to, to Tony Luhan. She had been staying with Mabel Dodge Luhan, and she was recommitted to finding her own happiness through her work. So she, was, she had made a kind of commitment to ignore what her husband was doing, which worked for another three years. But he continued to have whatever relationship he was having with Dorothy Norman. In 1932, she um, was approached by Rockefeller Center to do a mural in the center, which lots of New York artists were doing. She wanted to do it. They offered her a flat fee. She accepted it. And Stieglitz went ballistic. He said everything she did offended him. He, she should have gone to him instead of accepting it herself. He was the dealer. The price was too low. He didn't like institutions. He didn't like murals. He didn't like public art. And he was also furious at O'Keefe because he was causing her so much pain. Once, when you feel guilty towards someone, you're usually angry at them most of the time. He was angry at her all of the time. She was determined to do it. It was work she wanted to do. She wanted to be in a public space. She wanted to do a mural. She wanted to do something large scale. It was very frightening to her. All of these things were new and she might fail. And plus which her husband was hounding her and, and harassing her all the time. But she was determined to do it. The construction schedule was delayed and delayed and delayed, but the opening was not. So she was given less and less and less time to complete the work. And finally, in November, she went in one day. She, they told her, it, it's now ready for you to paint. And she went in and, and looked at the wall, and it was covered with canvas. And the, in one corner, the, the canvas was peeling off in front of her. She realized the entire wall was still wet, and nothing she did would be usable. So she quit. And then, because she had really betrayed her own trust, because she had quit, he hadn't quit for her. She had done it. She went into a terrible decline. She had um, insomnia. She had vertigo. She thought buildings were cl collapsing on her head. She had chest pains, blinding headaches. She couldn't eat. And she was hospitalized. She chains and pains in her heart. She was hospitalized for weeks, and she wasn't allowed to see Stieglitz. He was so upsetting to her. He was allowed to visit once a week for 10 minutes. She went and stayed with her sister when she got out of the hospital. Then she went to Bermuda with friends. It took her months to regain any kind of physical um, health again. And that summer, she went to Lake George with him. He, was, he had given up Dorothy Norman. He was so horrified that she'd nearly died. But she was very distant from him. And that fall, she stayed in Lake George without him. She spent the whole winter in Lake George, which was icebound and snowbound. And there was a friend who came up, Jean Toomer, who was a, the novelist of, of the Harlem Renaissance. He came up and spent several weeks with her, alone in the house in this beautiful, snow-filled landscape. And he was a very warm, spiritual person, and they talked in a way that was very useful to her. And he left. I don't know whether they had a... a a sexual affair or not, but they had they clearly had a very close relationship. And when they, they left, he left finally that spring, and she wrote to him, and um, she wrote him a letter. Sorry. What? Sorry, I've gotten ahead of myself here. She, she writes to him and says, If the past year or two has taught me anything, it is that my plot of earth must be tended with absurd care, by myself first. And if second by someone else, it must be with absolute trust. It seems it would be very difficult for me to live if it were wrecked again just now. 
So instead of blaming Stieglitz, she's again taking responsibility for her own happiness. She comes back to life and she sets up a pattern which will last until Stieglitz dies, which is she sets for herself the things she needs and the thing that she needs is to go to New Mexico every summer. She sets off in the summer She's, um, and she spends the whole summer with her artist friends. She comes back suntanned, happy, with a whole car full of paintings. She goes back to New York. She takes care of Stieglitz all winter. And then she takes him up to Lake George in the spring and leaves him there so that he is taken care of and she is taken care of. But she establishes something that will allow her to go on painting and to achieve the kind of happiness and completion that she needs. She never leaves Stieglitz. She decides that she loves him, she's going to let him be the person he is, and she will be the person that she is. They write to each other while they're apart. He writes her sometimes 14, 15 letters a day. She doesn't write that many, but they're very warm, affectionate letters. They tell each other everything. And they go on like that forever, for the rest of his life. But one of the things that she changes after those tender, vulnerable, fragile flower paintings, in the early 30s, she starts to paint the bone. And it's an entirely antithetical image to those tender, yielding petals, that immutable, um, resistant, smooth, hard bone. They're radiant, they're beautiful, but they are inflexible. And she's found something new in herself that she needs to connect to. So she still loves Stieglitz, but she won't let him control her life, and she certainly won't give up her happiness for him. At the end of his life, in 1946, um, he has finally given way. He hates museums, but he allows O'Keefe to have an, a one-man exhibition at the Mu Museum of Modern Art, which, of course, is a huge honor. She is there for the opening, and then afterwards she leaves and goes back to Santa Fe. And he writes her this letter. Incredible, Georgia, and how beautiful your pictures are at the Modern. Oh, Georgia, we are a team. And they were a team. They had made themselves into a team. They had mended their marriage after the horrible passage with Dorothy Norman. And it was really because of O'Keeffe's determination, her determination to seize her own happiness and to seize his as well, and to make their marriage into one that was, gave them both happiness. So she made that happen, made it through her work, um, through commitment and strength of character, her understanding of the great demands that life places on us, she was able to overcome nearly crippling passages of grief, fear, depression, and disappointment. She was able to choose happiness and step forward, determined to lead the life she wanted. She walked in the dark, and all the time she was afraid of snakes. But by morning she had reached the top, and the world lay before her and the sunrise. Thank you.